Hello, welcome everybody. You know, I'm really happy and excited to be here and all that. I always love talking about medical devices to medical device people, especially when it comes to, to chemistry and things like uh, like that. So it's been a, it's a really exciting time in the world of medical device chemistry and, and biocompatibility. There's a lot of things that have been changing. I think things are improving a lot. How I know that they're improving is that that there's just so much stuff going on. Now, I know that I've always said, and it's not just me, I think the community always says, yes, things are changing. And I think that part of the motivation for saying that is because we want to like reel people into these presentations and stuff like that. But this time I really mean it. Things are changing. I kind of feel like like the new parent with a two-year-old and they feel like they're coming up on the terrible twos. They say, okay, no, that's it. We've hit the terrible twos. Look at this ridiculous thing that the kid did. And then the kid takes a quart of olive oil and dumps it down the heater vent. And they're like, okay, no, now we really mean it. This is the terrible twos. Well, I'm telling you, the quart of olive oil has been dumped down the heater vent. This is happening right now. And, and so there's just a lot going on. Uh, maybe one of the bigger things is the new 10993-18. This is the final draft international standard. It's uh, really expanded uh, the scope of medical device chemistry with respect to biocompatibility. One of the the bigger things that that impacts you know me and the, and the work that I do is this. There's been kind of behind the curtains within CDRH and inside the FDA a lot of new scrutiny uh, scrutiny on medical device biocompatibility and the way that chemistry is done to support that biocompatibility. So they're asking a lot of very detailed and new questions that they haven't ever asked before. And, and that's kind of, uh, kind of a big deal. In addition to that, we have ISO 21726. I'll talk about that just a little bit uh, here today. And, uh, and I'll give it a little example of this thought process, uh, the, the newer thought process for chemistry, for medical device biocompatibility uh, here in a minute. So um, just to make sure we're all on the same page and to put this into context, when we talk about ISO 10993-18 and chemistry for medical device biocompatibility, we're really talking about evaluating biological endpoints that are identified as part of the 10993-1 uh, document and the FDA guidance on 10993-1. So, so this is table A1 from 10993-1. And uh, you can see for different types of device contacts and different device uh, durations that there's different biological risks that have been identified that need to be evaluated as part of this process. And, uh, and the, the first column there is chemical and physical and or chemical information. This is something that is required to be looked at for all device types and all device contacts. Really, the suggestion there is that no matter what type of device you have, you really should take a step back and ask yourself, you know, self, you know, what am I making my device out of? Is this safe? Does it not only meet these, you know, physical performance requirements, but is it a biocompatible uh, material? So uh, to give an example of that, if you have a device that's some sort of permanent implant, then you would categorize that obviously as permanent tissue bone contacting an implant device. And according to 10993-1, that list of biological endpoints would all need to be evaluated. And now the question is, once you know what biological endpoints need to have evaluation, how do you decide what the process is going to be to do that evaluation? So, so how are you going to uh, address those risks? And this is something that really has has shifted, or at least to me, like the, the thought process behind this has shifted a lot. So it used to be that we had biocompatibility experts and chemists and toxicologists, and they were all kind of like siloed in the sense that they didn't really need to talk to each other in order to be successful. And when you have these independent groups, like a biocompatibility expert that says, okay, yeah, genotoxicity testing is required. And then a chemist that has never talked to that biocompatibility expert does a chemistry study, but they might not know it's for genotoxicity you know, evaluation, gives that data to a toxicologist. And the toxicologist might say, well, I understand you want me to evaluate genotox, but this chemistry study isn't good. So now I can't. And 
And that type of thing just won't get through the FDA anymore, right? So in the past, we maybe would send things to the FDA with some strong limitation statements saying, look, we did the best we can. Uh, that's not going to work. So the way to, eva to go through this process really requires a team effort. There should be at a minimum a biocompatibility expert and chemist and a toxicologist all talking to each other in the planning phase of this in order for this to work. And, and usually this process goes something like this, where you have a device and you first make a biological evaluation plan. And this is where it's decided, okay, for this device, we need to eva evaluate genotoxicity and chronic toxicity. And to make that evaluation, we're going to do chemistry and a tox assessment. And then that plan is shown to the chemist and a toxicologist. And the toxicologist will say, well, if you want me to evaluate carcinogenicity for this CPAP machine, I'm gonna need you, I'm gonna need chemistry data that's like this. And the chemist may say, yeah, okay, we can do that. Or they may say, no, actually that's not, not even possible for us to do, right? We can't be that sensitive in our chemical analysis. We can't be that broad. And the two of them can work these details out on the forefront. And then this plan should, in the ideal situation, be given to the FDA and get their advice in the form of a, a pre-sub to make sure that they agree with it on the front end. So you have all these parties talking to each other and then the FDA before the testing even begins. And I think anything, uh, anything less than that you know, sets yourself up for a lot of uh, questions on the tail end when the timing becomes so critical in these, in these processes. Okay, uh, now of course, this whole plan and process should consider the, the you know, new updates to standards. That's really like a big part of what this uh, presentation is about. So we have the new 10993-18. This is final draft international standard. In Europe, this is like uh, gospel. Here in the US, the FDA you know, will accept parts of it. And you know, we hope that they give us more feedback soon about like what parts they're really going to, to uh, except uh, just to put it into to perspective, the Dash 18 that we've been working off of so far is 17 pages long. The new draft is 79 pages long. So this is really expanded in detail and scope. Uh, there's major revisions throughout the entire document, a really broader definition of chemical characterization. Uh, this idea of analytical evaluation threshold is new and, and in there. We've been talking about extractable and leachable chemistry testing for medical devices for a long time. This now actually, you know, clearly defines that. And, uh, and, and so it's really a greatly expanded document that definitely should be considered as you approach these types of studies for, for biocompatibility. Now, the, um, the definitions part of this are important. There's lots of definitions in the document. I'm just going to talk about a couple key ones. So this idea of an analytical evaluation threshold, this is new to medical device e &L. This is how low do you need to look when you're doing a chemistry study so that you could ignore everything underneath that amount. So what we were facing before is we would get like a chromatogram with a billion peaks and we would ask ourselves, okay, if we like go through and identify each of these billion peaks in detail, this study is going to take a year and cost a million dollars. But if we only analyze the top 15 peaks in detail, then we can get it done in a reasonable time frame. And nobody really knew how sensitive you really had to go. This uh, lays that out. It also talks about doing things that are analytically expedient. This is one of the, the details that I'm really glad made it into the document. It's something that when I have these discussions with the FDA, this comes up a lot. You know, we'll say, let's say we have a device that goes into the brain and we'll say, well, yeah, you know, we extract it in, in hexane because it's nonpolar. We know brain tissue is, you know, nonpolar also. And we analyze all these things that could come into hexane. And the FDA will say something like, well, why don't you put the piece of plastic in an actual piece of pig brain and analyze the pig brain? And we'll say, you know, we, we hear you on that. And that would take us like four years to figure out how to do because there's so much matrix interference from this brain tissue. There's thousands and thousands of chemicals in just natural brain tissue. Identifying all of those, figuring out which ones come from the plastic would be really, really hard. Uh, it would be unduly hard. 
So whatever we do for medical device CNL, it should be analytically expedient, means that it shouldn't be impossibly hard to do. So that's, that's something that we can point at. Of course, we have extractables. These are compounds that come from a medical device under laboratory conditions and leachables. These are compounds that we expect to come from the device during clinical use, though it's something that we can't ever actually measure or that in practice we never measure, right? Because we don't put a device into living tissue and then measure the living tissue. Um, I guess the, the one exception might be for something like an IV bag where we could do like a leachable study in, uh, in saline, but for devices that contact the body correctly or directly, this isn't something that we, we do. Another new part to uh, the, the new Dash 18 are these recommended extraction conditions. We can see here for prolonged and long-term contact devices, these uh, so-called exhaustive extraction conditions are recommended. Exhaustive extraction means that the device is extracted for a sufficiently long time so that you're sure that greater than 90% of what can leave the device does leave the device. It's one of the things that irritates me the, the most about this whole setup. I don't like exhaustive extractions uh, at all, and, and I'll explain why. Um, and then, you know, they recommend exhaustive, but a credible alternative would be a more analytically expedient, exaggerated condition uh, scenario. So about exhaustive extractions, I, I mean, I can't mention it without like getting riled up and like just side barring a little bit. So, <laughs> I think that that was put in there because whoever was wanting to have it in there didn't really understand diffusion physics. And, and my, my background is really more in physics than anything else. And if you take a look at the physics of diffusion, this is a very well understood process. We know how compounds migrate through plastic materials and then enter into matrices that are surrounded. And there's nothing new about that at, at all. So fixed law of diffusion is there. We have lots of nice solutions to fixed law of diffusions. The one that I'm showing here is the Perringer model. This is a very well-behaved equation. You can plot it in Excel. And if I, if I take uh, the actual amount of a plasticizer that's released by polyurethane, you can see that fixed law of diffusion does indeed fit and we can model how chemicals leave the device. So the, the red line there is the predicted amount using the Perringer model and the dots are the actual measured data points we measured every 24 hours. And so, so this is what we expect to see from devices. This agrees with, uh, with, with physics. The, um, from a toxicological perspective, we care about the graph on the bottom. This is the amount released per day. It's always the dose that makes the poison right. So we wanna know how much per day would a person be exposed to. And we can see, as predicted, the dose per day you know, tapers off. Now, that's not, even though we know that this happens, that's not how we actually evaluate medical devices using toxicology because we want to be very, very conservative. What we do is we take the total amount over three days and we assume that that total amount is the chronic lifetime daily exposure. So we say if this were the graph where, you know, it tapers off like that, we would take the total amount from the three days. That would be in this case be 14 micrograms per day. And we would say the user of the device is exposed to that every day for the rest of their life which if you take the number of days in an expected rest of somebody's life, that really, really overestimates the total amount that could be in there. In this case, you know, it'd be 350,000 micrograms, which, you know, depending on the device may weigh even more than the device itself. But that's what we assume. Now, this exhaustive extraction thing would make that even more insanely conservative, while at the same time exposing us to some analytical chemistry problems by like extracting for too long and so on. Okay, I could talk about how much I dislike exhaustive extractions for a very long time. I'm just gonna slowly move on from that. Okay, another key point, I brought up the analytical evaluation threshold. This is uh, super useful and important. It's based off of this idea of the TTC or the threshold of toxicological concern. We have these TTCs, they come from this new ISO document, ISO 21726. You can see for different device duration contacts, there's different thresholds of toxicological concern. It means that if you have a device that contacts a person for less than 30 days, then if something is leaving that device and contacting the body, if the amount per day is less than 120 micrograms, it's uh, that concentration is so low, we don't even care what that compound is, 
right? So these are very, very low conservative thresholds that are designed to provide like, provide like a baseline. Like if it's less than this, then we don't care anymore. So how that informs the AET is if we have a chromatogram like this, and you can see we have all of these peaks and we need to know which ones we need to go through the effort of identifying things. Uh, using the TTC, we can say, okay, wait a second, 120 micrograms per day, that's this many micrograms per liter on our instrument, which is this many counts. And we say, oh, okay, actually we only need to identify these eight compounds and all of the ones that are underneath that we know aren't concerning from a tox perspective because they're below the TTC. This is, uh, this is new in the document, super duper useful. Uh, we use it every day now. Another thing in the document is that uh, this idea that screening approaches are really essential. So uh, in the past, it wasn't always agreed whether or not we should have like a nice long list of compounds that we check devices against, or if you open it up and you look for anything and everything that could come from the device, and figure it out from there. So this makes it abundantly clear uh, that we really need to use a screening approach where we look for anything and everything that could come from the device. We want to look for as much as we can. So in, in order to do that, you really need a range of analytical techniques that cover a broad scope. Uh, the, the default recommendation would be to look for metals by ICPMS, uh, volatile organics using Headspace GCMS. We can use regular GCMS for semi-volatiles and up to a limit non-volatiles. And then you need to have uh, liquid chromatography with high resolution accurate mass to really screen for the heaviest molecules that, that you have. So I think uh, if you're preparing a submission uh, for the FDA, or you're thinking about doing chemistry and it's going to go to the FDA, if you don't have at a minimum, these four methods, then you're going to have some problems unless you have a really strong justification. And, and even in addition to this, I've seen the FDA now like digging into details of the LCH RAM, you know, what ionization modes did you use and, and, uh, and how do you know what the recoveries are and the sample prep and things like that. So they're getting really detailed oriented about these methods. Another thing I've seen the FDA uh, start to, uh, to pay a lot of attention to is this identification process. So I've seen, um, I, I'm probably on the phone with the FDA once a week now, like going over questions that they have with studies from, from all sorts of different labs. And one of the things that I hear them asking is, so you've identified this compound as whatever, a crown ether. How do you know that that's the compound? And we might say, well, you know, that's the highest match to the NIST uh, database. And they would, might say, well, you know, how do you know that that's really the right compound? And then you can start to go down this path where they're really expecting some detailed justification on how you know the things that you identified. They, they don't want this possibility of like misidentified compounds. And you can see an example here. Uh, that, so if we take a crown ether that that we have a standard for in the lab and we inject it in the instrument and let NIST uh, make an automatic identification. It identifies this compound down there in the bottom left, which we just know is not the, the right compound. So, so these automatic identifications can uh, produce you know, incorrect results. I think the, the key here, the, the key solution to this problem is, you know, if you're doing a chemistry study on the outset, there should be this conversation with the lab. How do you identify things? And, and is it all automatic or do you have like a flesh and blood expert, you know, making, you know, decisions about what the identifications are? And if they are making those decisions, then, you know, what are the, the limits associated with that? Because it could be down the line that the FDA uh, makes you defend what those identifications are. Yeah. So these are the things that uh, that that we've been seeing that are that are related to the key changes. Uh, let's just you know walk through an example with a, a 3D printed resorbable medical device. So the reason why I pick a 3D printed resorbable medical device is because I just really love 
3D printing, and we've been you know doing a, a few of these lately. It's it's really really cool, the stuff that you can do. So within the scope of 3D printing technology and 3D printed medical devices, there's uh, a few different technologies that that are out there that have already been used really commonly. So so 3D printed metal medical devices. So like out of titanium and steel. Uh, these are actually really common now. They've been on the market for years. We've probably tested over 30 of these and there's been no issues. Sometimes we, we get them, we don't, we wouldn't ever know that it was a 3D printed metal device. So this is where it's titanium powder and a laser like melts it down. So these are great and common. Uh, the 3D printed plastic medical devices have been a little bit more challenging and slower to come to the market. So there's some that are like dental aligners. This is a little bit more common 3D printed plastic device. Um, and then a little bit more recently, we've seen 3D printed bioresorbable medical devices. These are pretty awesome. Um, in the case that, that I'm thinking of, there's one. Uh, it's, it's not this the device I show a picture of because I didn't didn't have permission for the real one, but it's a device that's, you know, intended for like traumatic, sur like traumatic reconstructive surgery to the face, right? So you can imagine if you have like a really bad injury and you need the structure of your face rebuilt, they can do an MRI of the non-damaged part, mirror image it using some CAD software and then print a matching piece out of this resorbable material that slowly uh, goes away over time. So in, in this case, if we take uh, something made from, say, a polylactic acid powder, it's printed using this uh, powder-based laser melting uh, process, then, uh, then we can accomplish that type of thing. So uh, we've had a few of these come to us. The first question always is, okay, what are we going to test, actually? So we know how it should be categorized, permanent tissue bone contacting, uh, but then every device is different. And so, you know, it, it's hard to know which thing is really going to be representative. So the first step is always designing a, a worst case construct that's going to be more challenging to pass from the perspective of biocompatibility than any one of these that will ever be printed in actual use. And you can see one of these designs that we, uh, that we made here, right? So we said, okay, well, the mesh, you know, the real device would only ever have this surface area. So we're going to take two times that surface area. We look at the number of tap, you know, like holes, narrow holes that could be difficult to clean and so on. And we'll design one of these to be the worst case thing that, that we would uh, test. That's kind of like the first part of the battle. And then once we know what this thing is, I would always recommend for a 3D printed and any resorbable device that you definitely do this pre-sub process with the FDA and make, make sure that they agree. Okay, the, the next step was trying to decide what the AET is. So now here's a case where this device is permanently contacting tissue bone. Uh, so in the past we would have said, okay, the, the TTC that's relevant would be 1.5 micrograms per day because that's the permanent contact TTC. But since we have the new ISO 21726, we know that if it has contact duration less than 10 years, then we can use a higher TTC, this TTC of 10, right? And we know that it's less than 10 years because we know how long this thing takes to, uh, to resort. So we said that the TTC that's relevant, it would be 10 micrograms per device, really it's 10 micrograms per day. And then, you know, we'll take that and we'll say, well, we have a little bit of uncertainty in the way that we do our measurements. So we'll really make that threshold at, at five. So we'll use like an uncertainty factor of two. Um, when it comes to exhaustive extraction for resorbable devices, exhaustive extraction is something that doesn't make any sense, regardless of how you feel about diffusion in physics, right? Because you, you know that the device isn't intended to stop releasing compounds. It's supposed to continue releasing until it's gone. So this extraction will really never be exhaustive. It's just going to get resorbed. Now, if you do have a resorbable device, so of course you're not gonna do exhaustive extraction, but what you might need to do is measure the chemical profile of the device at different time points along the degradation lifetime or pathway. So if it takes three years for this thing to resorb, you probably are gonna do an initial and like a 50% resorbed, either accelerated aging, or you might sit it in a, a jar 
and let it degrade for an extended period of time and then measure that again. And the point of that is to demonstrate that the profile of this thing doesn't change over time as it sits in the body and through this resorption process. And that was the, that's the case for these devices. So we've gone through the initial one and the second one and the, the third, we're gonna do three time points. That one's still in its accelerated aging process. Uh, with respect to solvents, you know, I put this graph up here as kind of kind of fun. I mean, we there's there's default solvents that are just really recommended, like strongly recommended by the FDA. And they want to for for prolonged or permanent devices, they want to see a polar, a midpolar, and a nonpolar solvent. And almost always this is water and IPA and hexane. And and the reason why we do that is we want to cover the range of polarities that a device might experience inside the body. So water is a no brainer, we think, because our bodies are made up mostly of water and, you know, a non-polar thing like hexane kind of makes sense because we have lots of lipids and other things in our body that we know are non-polar. And we throw in a mid-polar for, you know, reasons that don't make a lot of good scientific sense, but the FDA asks us to, right? Uh, so we do that to cover the spectrum of polarities. I don't think that, you know, in generation three of these types of testing plans and standards, I don't think it has to be that way um, because we know the polarity of mixed body tissues. The, the, the polarity of blood, for example, is around 75 to 73 um, in terms of dielectric constant. And we, and we can make sol uh, solution mixtures that match these polarities of, of tissues. We could do this a little bit, a uh, little bit more detailed. You can see sometimes we recommend 10% ethanol in water because this really nicely matches the polarity of, uh, of blood. Okay, so in this case, we didn't do exhaustive extraction. 50 degrees C in 72 hours and three solvents: water, IPA, and hexane. This is kind of a an interesting one too. So we know that the FDA would, no matter what, demand that we at least try three solvents. Uh, we also knew that IPA would dissolve the device, but we did it anyways, right? So we put the device in IPA, we dissolved it, we took a picture of it, we said, see, look, it did what we expected. We tried IPA and that was, uh, that was enough, um, enough for the FDA. Uh, we had several coupons together that, that we used to make sure that we had the analytical sensitivity that we needed. And then we analyzed it for the, for the works. Okay, so here's what the, the results looked like. Uh, you can see actually it's very, uh, very clean, which uh, there's some, you know, been some skepticism about 3D printed medical devices. It's like new and kind of scary. Uh, but, but actually for major classes of these devices, my experience has been that, that there isn't a whole lot there that could be, uh, could be concerning. And I, I think the reason for that is that uh, compared to other plastic devices, 3D printed ones have been from the very, very beginning with the material formulation designed to be very biocompatible. Whereas, you know, a more traditional medical device made from a plastic probably uses a plastic supplier upstream that didn't really intend it to be used for, in, you know, considering extractables and leachables. Uh, so, so far, the experience with uh, many of these devices has been very good. So if it's a if it's a fused deposition modeling type device or a laser melted device or a metal device, it's been as clean or cleaner than their regular counterparts. Now, if it's a photolithographic device, it starts to be kind of a crap storm, right? And you can imagine why, right? So, so this whole photolithographic process, you're going to have lots of different varying degrees of, uh, of polymerization throughout this printing process. And there's gonna be all sorts of things that are like partially pol polymerized. The, the formulations of these are really complicated. So for the 3D printed photolithographic devices, it's been a little bit more of an uphill battle. But I think that, uh, I think that we are getting there and, and we can get there. What we wanna avoid is situations like this. This was like a you know, first iteration on a, on a coupon for one of these devices where uh, you get many compounds that have a margin of safety from a tox perspective, much less than one. Those are all those red ones. And then a lot of un unidentified compounds are going to be uh, be definitely a red flag. 
So of course, to put this like all, tie this all together here, we've been talking a lot about the new 10993-18 and the way that we do this chemistry. I wanna make sure that the bigger picture here is captured. So we do this chemistry, we get results like that, but the, the reason why we do it is so that a toxicologist can take a look at the results and make a claim about biological effects. So, so the, the chemistry results aren't the stopping point. It's just one step along the path. The next step is to have a toxicologist look at it. And the toxicologist will say, well, considering the device is a dental aligner that sits in the mouth for you know eight hours a day during the night for the patient's life, it's permanent. And these results say that it's not gonna cause cancer, right? And then that part, this toxicological risk assessment, even that's not really the end point either, right? And if you just stop there with the tox assessment, I think the FDA will, will kick it back. The tox assessment addresses that biological effect, you know, genotoxicity, subacute, subchronic toxicity, chronic toxicity, and, and carcinogenicity. That's, that's right there in this middle testing and risk assessments phase of the whole process. What the FDA really expects and I've seen this a lot recently, is a final summary report that takes everything that happened and puts a nice bow on it, you know, tells a very nice story, puts a bow on it, and concludes with whether or not the device is biocompatible. So this is what we would say is a, a biological evaluation report. In my view, it's 100% essential if you're going to submit a device uh, to the FDA. I, I think uh, I see TUFSUD and BSI looking for these types of things uh, as well. What it does is you say, here's the device, here's how it's used, these were the biological risks that were identified, this is what we did to try to uh, address those risks. If there's any problems like a cytotoxicity failure or some other failure along the way, we say, here's the test that we had a problem with, this is why it does or doesn't matter. And then in the end, it should, you know, hopefully conclude, you know, based off of all of these testing results, the chemistry that we did, the tox assessment, the cytotoxicity, based off of all of that, the device is biocompatible. And this really tells the reviewer a story and helps them come to the, the same conclusion that this whole team of people has come to through this whole evaluation uh, process. Okay. With that, you know, usually I ramble and ramble and uh, go like an hour too long, but I, I think I've burned through that pretty quickly. That's actually the, the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have in the time remaining, or uh, you can also talk to me uh, after the, the talk as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question was, since we've looked at lots of different 3D printing methods, are there some methods where we've been able to see that that are a little bit more concerning from a toxicological perspective than than others? And, and can we like really define that? And the the short answer is yes. Right. So, so um, if we take a look at 3D printing methods, like in general, like uh, like powder bed fusion methods, either with uh, laser melting or EV melting or, or whatever. Uh, these have so far been really great, right? They're, they're really clean. If it's a metal thing that you're melting, that's no problem from a tox perspective. If it's a polymer thing, normally this is a very like pure powdered or milled polymer that's made for this purpose. Okay, the, uh, the FDM methods, so like fused deposition modeling, this is where like a fiber gets drawn through a nozzle and it writes it out. Maybe the most common one that, that you've might seen. Um, these, if it's intended for medical device, then usually it's great because the, the maker of the printer is also designing the formulation of this plastic filament and they design it without having like bright colors in there and without having lots of crazy additives that are gonna be a problem that where there's a, an issue so far has been with these photolithographic methods, right? So with, in every case with these, if you think about the chemistry that has to happen for that, you have a, a photo activator, 
you have stabilizers, and you have monomers, and then this polymerization process is activated by a UV light or a laser, and it's never homogeneously polymerized, and you have these activators left over, and from a tox perspective, those have been a little bit more, uh, more challenging. So I'd say if you were thinking about making a 3D printed medical device, the powder bed fusion way would be, you know, the first line approach and then maybe FDM uh, as a follow up to that. It's a great question. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? No? Yeah. So the, the question was, this is a complex process with several steps, you know, this biological evaluation plan, chemistry testing, toxicological risk assessment. Does the FDA ever give you feedback or additional things to, to test? And uh, the, the answer is yes, that can happen. And it's something that, you know, if you've gone through this experience of going through this whole testing process and evaluation process, and then had the FDA ask you to do more, it can feel pretty frustrating, right? Because you're often like waiting to send a device to market for this clearance from the FDA. Uh, so cases where I've seen it are where we've tested everything and everything passed, but because of special concerns on the part of the FDA due to the intended use population, they may ask for additional testing or information. I've also seen it with resorbable devices where they've said, okay, wait a second, we love all of this stuff that you've done, but let's see what happens when you put this device in a sheep for a year. And then, you know, then you either need to talk to them about it or, uh, or you do the testing, right? So, so it does happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no clear guideline ahead of time other. So the FDA has guidance application of 10993-1 that provides a framework for that. Now, if you follow the FDA's guidance on the application of 10993-1, there's no guarantee that they're going to just accept it, right? So that's why more and more, it's really, really great advice to go through this pre-submission process and say, here's our device, here's what we plan to do, what do you think? And then hopefully, you know, hopefully you get that feedback early. So they may say, yeah, we love all of that. And it's all according to standard. And we want you to test in pH one solution. And we're like, okay, all right, we'll do that. We'll test in pH one solution too, you know? And so, um, yeah, there's no guarantees. You basically, the best way to do it is to ask the FDA up front in a pre-sub, which is a, a free process. The only cost to you is the time that it takes to file the paperwork and wait for them to respond. Yeah. So, so the question is, if you were to order ENL analysis, do we have toxicologists available to do the assessment? So the, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, I happen to be both a chemist and a, a board certified toxicologist. So that, you know, kind of helps. I think that if you are going to do this process, no matter what, the chemist and toxicologist have to talk to each other ahead of time. So whether or not the lab that you use has their own toxicologist, for sure those two parties need to talk to each other. So you should know who your toxicologist is and who is doing the chemistry testing before you start chemistry testing. Yeah, all, all different groups have different backgrounds and areas of expertise. And you know, we do a lot of toxicological evaluation of chemistry data from other labs, other than outside of Nielsen Labs. And, and we also do a lot of chemistry for review by other toxicologists. So it can go either way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the question is, what's the EU regulation and is it aligned with the FDA? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as we know, the EU has a new regulation, the medical device regulation, the, the MDR, that's uh, coming into effect of May 2020. So it's right around the corner. And uh, right now, 
we have that framework and we have the new 10993-1 and we have 10993-18 uh, in final draft, uh, what we don't have is a lot of experience with notified bodies and how they're going to interpret and internalize all of this stuff, right? So uh, I think we can say categorically that no, the FDA and these notified bodies aren't likely to agree. So I, I don't think that they're going to agree on everything. In my experience with notified bodies in Europe has been that they take 1093 series to be a lot more like gospel and literal than the FDA does. So the FDA will take 1093 and say, hmm, th those sound like good suggestions and here's what we think and maybe we'll ask for this and maybe we won't. Uh, people like, uh, or organizations like BSI and Tufsud, they, they seem to take that a lot more literally. And so I, I think that that's one of the key differences. Uh, another key difference between uh, the FDA and uh, the MDR are you know these requirements like complying with the CMR part. So this is essential requirement 10.4 that you don't have any carcinogenetic, mutagenetic, or reproductive toxin in your material above 0.1%. So that's a requirement there. That's not a requirement here in the U.S. That can be, depending on the situation, challenging to to prove. So I would definitely keep that point in mind. Yeah. Okay, great. Then I think that we are actually now about out of time. So it's been uh, nice, you know, chatting and thank you for listening. And uh, I'm available to talk after as much or as little as you want.